Gather yourself together with Fringes. Fringes is a new social networking app for the community. Are you looking to study, teach, cook, play, sew, and travel? Perhaps you're new to the area and are tired of spending Sabbaths alone? Are you looking for a place to post your events, products, and services? Rejoice! Fringes is here. Download free today. Available on Google Play and the App Store. Brother B.A. Ben Abraham, Yo. and I'm your host of the Man Up segment on the Debate Talk For You platform. The objective is for all brothers from different walks of life to come together, link up, and build on matters concerning all various stages of life. If anyone would like to reach out on concepts and ideas, you can reach Brother B.A. at Radical Ryan 1984 at gmail.com. Again, hey, Radical Ryan 1984 at gmail.com. Tap in. Let's build. Tap. Shalom. Shalom. Brand disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed by individuals on this platform, the callers plus invited guests, are their own. The information you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with this brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live or via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. Yo, what's up with it? What's up with it? Man, it's been a long, long summer. And the Man Up segment is back in action. I'm your host, B.A. Ben Abraham, and you're now tuned in to the Big Talk for You. And man... Before I get started, I would just like to say this. Much love to everybody out there listening who show support to Sal Showtime and the whole debate talk for you family. Much love to all. And today we got a powerful conversation. I'm going to allow my special guest to introduce himself. Go right ahead, my brother. Hey, peace to everybody listening in. This is Brother LeVar from Absolute Bible Truth. I'm so honored to be on the show. Um, the brother reached out to me, asked me would I be willing to participate. You know, we've grown to have a, a decent relationship in talking about certain issues that uh, believers face, and we just want to edify the people, of course. Shout out to all my people in Absolute Bible Truth. Uh, I'm ecstatic because I love to get feedback from the debate talk for you listening audience, and I, I want you guys to participate. I want to have a healthy dialogue, and hopefully, you know, once again, everybody be edified. Thank you. Most definitely, Brother LaVar. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. Praise the most high for you. I can feel it in the air. <laughs> I'm just feeling good right now, man. I'm just feeling so certified, man. I'm on point right now. All praise is due to the most high in the name of his whole, in the name of his only anointed known as Yeshua the Christ. And your cell. Can you feel it, my dude? Hey, what's going on, fam? What's going on? We all here. That's right. We talk. Yeah, what's the word? I, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just feeling so lovely right now, my dude. You just don't know. Uh, <laughs> you man. Got the energy up. <laughs> Go all ahead, right, dude. Know, yeah, let the people know what the title of the show is. That. Most death. Today's topic is American politics and its influence on our spirituality. Again, American politics and its influence on our spirituality. And the reason why I um, I decided to speak about this is because I see a lot of the, currently today on the, on the political spectrum, we see a lot of behavior that seems to be very well immature. And normally the people who are in office, they are a reflection of the people who they represent or who they're ruling over. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about politics, and we're going to line it up with the religious spectrum as well, which consists of Christian Dome, the Hebrew-Israelite movement, and various other doctrines that go with that. So uh, before we get into the meat of the conversation, 
Uh, I know Brother LeVar, he wanted to break down some things about politics when it comes to the different styles or the different parties or the different ideologies. And, Brother, at this time, you can go right ahead and get into it if you would like. And thanks, Brother B.A. Um, just real quick, because a lot of people, I've heard a lot of strange things come out of people's mouths. So when we talk about politics and how politics within themselves uh, affect our spirituality, we have to define some things. And uh, number one, when I say people say strange things in regards to religious and spirituality, I think that, you know, everybody's opinionated. You can have your own opinion, but I just associate the religious aspect of my life with the spiritual part of my life. I, they're not different, I don't think. Because when you talk about spirituality, this is about being concerned with your soul salvation. And, and for me, I don't try to define it as anything else. So my spirituality is birthed through my religion. And, of course, as many of you know, I believe in the religion of the Jews. And the word religion does not have a negative connotation because at its core it means to bind or connect. Well, bind or connect to who? Well, to my God. So in all actuality, spirituality is just simply binding or connecting to your God. And I believe in the Most High God of Israel. So the way politics, and I'm going to define that in a second, has affected a lot of our spirituality is that a lot of people who claim they believe in God or uh, many gods, they look to their leaders for guidance and they look to their leaders for substance. And in our, cur- our current political climate, a lot of people are just not getting that. A lot of people look at this whole presidential uh Thing right now as unpresidential They don't look At Donald Trump as somebody Presidential and I don't myself uh, And we see A large part of the country actually Supports what we would call In our community buffoonery That's going on so I just want To take one second real quick Just to define what politics Is from a baseline Standpoint because it covers So many different areas of our lives You can't escape it but just the baseline, like, government term for politics, it just simply means the activities that are associated with the ruling of a country. So these current activities that have been associated with ruling our country, a lot of people are affected by these things. And, of course, I'm coming from the spiritual aspect or the religious aspect of it and how it's affecting our people because – I'm going to just be honest with y'all. I see people who claim to be Christians, Israelites, so on and so forth, say the stupidest stuff. I mean, I read a quote from a woman online one time, and I'm going to be quick and hand it over back to the brother. I've seen a quote where she says, I believe Trump over Jesus. Now, again, I'm no fan of Trump, and I don't hate the president. I don't hate nobody. In fact, our Bible tells us to pray for Trump. And we'll read some scriptures to prove that later on if we have to. But the whole point is when a so-called Christian or a believer starts to say stuff like this, this lets me know, number one, these politics in our current political climate is affecting believers in such a way that people really don't understand how ignorant they sound. Whenever you hear a person say, quote, unquote, I trust Trump over Jesus, over Yeshua, then you just got to shake your head and go, well, why are you idolizing this man like this? Why do you hold him at such regard? And what in the world has he done for you? How has he blessed your life to the point where you could say such an asinine statement? So the brother comes to me and and. From a whole other angle, we we were talking about black Hebrewism, which is nothing but a black eye to the face, in my humble opinion, when it comes to us believers in Christ that want to follow Torah. These guys just give the whole faith a black eye. And we began to talk about this starting with them because we noticed a spike in 
uh, the proclamation of the black Hebrews because of this current president that we got. See, black Hebrews use the ignorance of Trump to gain more followers. And this is how me and the brother D.A. began to start this conversation. But then as I looked around in other parts of, 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 of different uh, denominations of religions, I started to see this man is affecting uh, all of our spirituality, not just from the black Hebrewism perspective, but just from from a totality perspective. So, you know, I'm going to end it right there, and I'm going to give it back over to the brother, and however he want to come uh, with whatever he got, I'm going to let him do that right now. <clears throat> man, thank you, LaVar, for your words. Some good food right there. Hopefully we can all marinate on that and think about it. So what we're going to do, I'm going to start off with reading a little bit of an article. And it's called The Seven Deadly Sins of American Politics. And yo, Sal, I got a question for you real quick before we jump into it. This article, I would like to add it into the, on the YouTube channel inside the subscription box. So what I'll do, I'll, I'm going to send you this one. And um, yeah. as well, I'm going to send you another article I'm going to read um, as well. So would that be okay? Okay, that's no problem. All right, for sure. I appreciate you. Much love. Again, the seven deadly sins of, of American politics, and it says pride. And I'm going to start off, and here and it reads. This is about politics overall, but somebody in particular. Donald Trump may boast to the world, as he did in his Republican National Convention speech, that I alone can fix it, his quote. But deep down, countless other politicians believe the very same thing about themselves. In some ways, a megalomaniacal billionaire like Trump merely represents a more advanced case of someone with excessive self-confidence, one that lays bare the architecture of the ego adult brain and the 140-character burst of narcissistic bombastic. Hmm. Let's keep going. When it comes to pride... The writer and Christian apologist by the name of C.S. Lewis once labeled it the great sin because, in his quote, leads to, leads to every other vice in politics where the intoxication of power can magnify even the most modest character flaw. Pride is often the original sin, that, that sense of personal importance that both fuels a politician's ambitions and prefigures his we prefigures his or hers demise. Man, ain't that something? Let's keep going. Rise by the sword, fall by the sword. Being a public servant is not for the timid or the humble, particularly in this modern day age when running for office. And the endless phone calls, handshakes, fundraisers, entails and, and, and requires an almost pathological level of drive and determination. And amongst U.S. presidential contenders seeking the highest office in, in the land, such ambition is particularly pronounced if you are asking for the power, excuse me, if you are asking for the power to blow up the world, says Claremont McKinney, college professor, of a college professor, then you have a very big ego to begin with. Okay, so you see the ego is just pretty much has taken on, has manifested live with, with not just Trump, but with various politicians before him, and it will continue based on the way of the world. You know how the world is. And I'm, I'm going to read a little bit more, and I'm going to stop. For an example, take Theodore Roosevelt, a hyper-energetic, freakish, industrious man of action, an adventurer who wrote roughly 40 books and penned letters as if they were tweets. Hmm, more like over 150,000 in total. Roosevelt, not unlike Trump, turned his robust egotism into a personal brand that became larger than life. Mm. So, Brother LeVar, you want any comments so far from what you heard? So, basically what I'm getting from what you just read is, uh, in the past, we've had a figure in history that uh, manifests himself with this whole thing about being very egotistical, and his name was Theodore Roosevelt. And it talks about how he would be writing these books. And this is the same thing we see today. See, people think that what President Trump is doing today, every single time he's in some sort of jam, he's actually redirecting your attention to something else going on in America by tweeting. So 
this whole thing about having ego and the communication with the people, see, these things are very baseline for a person in power that has the attitude of a Donald Trump or a Theodore Roosevelt. Whenever they're faced with some type of adversity, they're going to direct your attention somewhere else. This has been happening ever since he got in office. There's been so many scandals dealing with Donald Trump, and I don't want to make this about Donald Trump, but it just reminds me of some of the things that I've heard, some of the things I've seen, and I'm not one to jump on social media and believe everything that I hear, but you can't help but see it because it's everywhere nowadays. I mean, information is just being passed through over and over and over, article after article after article. And these people, like a Theodore Roosevelt, who's very – he was very – I mean, the, the charisma that both of these guys have and the way in which they carry themselves, you know, you can't always trust people like that because only thing you can see is the charisma. This Again, this is why that woman said, I believe Trump over Jesus. Now, she was a so-called Christian. So what we have to look at is, okay, number one, was this man qualified in the first place? Number two, if he doesn't meet the qualifications, why is he in there? And that's politics within politics because it seems to me now that if you're not meeting the criteria, then the only thing you have to do before you became a president-elect is have some sort of following, some sort of fame, some sort of riches, some sort of notoriety in a whole different area. So now what we're getting nowadays is basically C-minus students to lead the free world. How does that happen? I mean, seriously, you already got speechwriters in place to write speeches for you. A lot of these guys don't even have military experience anymore. At least Abraham Lincoln was a lawyer in his own right. That'll let you know he had smarts. But we all know Trump from his past has how many bankruptcies he's had. He's not the smart businessman like people think he is. He just has notoriety. He's been a part of Ponzi uh, get quick rich schemes. I've watched uh, a couple of different documentaries on Netflix. I'm quite sure you guys have too. But what we got to understand is this article is saying that these guys with these egos let their pride get the best of them. Whenever you give a man like that too much power, he takes it like he's on the football field, except for after he scores a touchdown, he want to jump in the stands. After that, he want to take your wife with him because of his pride. He has an ego. He doesn't know how to just score, hand the ball to the ref, go over there, slap high fives with his teammates. He don't know how to do that. No, he wants all the glory. Anybody that's been living in these past two years, they can see nothing but fear mongering that's been going on because this man's ego has been out of control, prideful. <laughs> and, and one thing, I'm going to say this before I get off, one thing that we have to understand is that even though the Bible tells us to pray for this man, even though the Bible tells us to pray for this man, it doesn't say you have to like him, okay? So, you know, nobody's doing any double talk here, but we have to understand that when, when you're dealing with politics, there are so many games being played by, by lobbyists. These are people who use tactics to just basically influence legislators for whatever political gain they can get out of it. There's so many different examples of just bad leadership going on within politics that you you can't just look to these people as if they're perfect, but you have to pray for them because if you pray for them, what God can do is turn their hearts. Mm. And if God can turn their hearts and help them get rid of all this pride and all this ego, then you have for yourself a better leader. Mm. So, Because I know a lot of people heard when I said you should pray for Trump. A lot of them probably was like, man, I'm hanging up the phone right now. This is a sellout. <laughs> but if I'm a sellout, then I'm a sellout for, for what the Bible is actually telling me. Again, we can get into some scriptures, but all I'm saying is this. You want your leader to be a man of character, a man of the most high. The second we stop praying for our leaders in this country, 
I mean, what do you think is going to happen? Mm. I'll leave that up to y'all imaginations. But go ahead, bro. Most definitely, brother. And all the things that Brother LeVar just expounded on when it comes to the ego, the pride, the charisma, and the behavior, have we, have you noticed that it's starting to hit or take effect on the so-called religious, uh, religious spectrum as well? It also has taken effect and has enticed our religious or our spiritual leaders, like our pastors, our elders, the bishops, the deacons, you know, the high priests, or the so-called individuals like to call themselves high priests. Uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing to me how a person can call themselves high priests, and at the same time they'll say Christ is their high priest. Man, ain't that something. But let's move on. All right. I'm going to move on, and I'm going to go into a little bit more of this article that we really finna get into it, though. Now, this kind of extreme self-esteem can morph into irrational confidence in one's own abilities when exposed to pull of power. A prideful leader starts to believe he really can change the world, that he knows what is best or others, and that normal laws and mores no longer morals no longer apply to his self-ordained quest. Ain't that something? Now we're going to get into something that's called the Herbris Syndrome. And it reads, true political Herbris through is more than an outgrowth of ambition or occupational hazards that can exaggerate existing narcissism in, in a politician. Repeated exposure to power, including unaccustomed thoughts, may fundamentally alter a leader's brain chemistry. Uh-oh. Seems like somebody... It's like, or these individuals who take upon this type of syndrome or have this type of behavior, they're losing touch with reality because their head is so far up their rear ends, they forgot they live on Earth. And their head has grown as big as the universe. But I want to look at this word hubris real quick. Hubris. And it's a term that we can trace back to Greek mythology. Give me a second. And it reads... The hubris, and it reads, in this ancient Greek context, it typically describes behavior that defies the norms of behavior or challenges of the gods, in which in turn brings about downfall or nemesis of the perpetrator of hubris. Hmm, let's see what's up, what else, wherever else it says. And let's look at it in the dictionary. So it's some type of complex, some type of way of thinking. And what we're going to do... I want to look at it in the dictionary so we get a, a thorough, a much more thorough definition. Excuse me. Hubris, according to the, de- de- to the uh, Webster's Encyclopedia under Bridge Dictionary, and it reads, excessive pride or self-confidence, arrogance. Wow, we got a whole bunch of scriptures dealing with that. Man, that's crazy. I want to go to an example, an example of a person or an example within the scriptures when the hubris syndrome is being displayed. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 14. And as we're turning there, Brother LeVar, you want to say a quick comment, if you would like? Yeah, just real quick. um, So what you're basically doing is you're describing somebody with a narcissistic personality disorder. Mm. And so the type of traits this person has is false humility and a whole bunch of self-admiration. <laughs> Remind you of somebody? See, the thing is, man, when you have somebody over you, you don't want nobody too sure of themselves. You don't want, you don't want nobody too confident in themselves. You know how? You know why? Because a lot of times this rubs off on people. And when these people don't meet the standard, how does that affect you? Now, you sitting there feeling like, I don't think I can trust nobody. He let me down. I believed in him to such a degree that I believe that his words trumped Jesus' words. But anyway, go ahead, bro. (laughs) And like I said, not only are we talking about our politicians federally or locally, but we're talking about also our spiritual advisors, 
personally in our day-to-day lives rather than to be on social media, inside the churches, inside the camps. This is not in particularly talking about an in particular person or an in particular camp. We're talking about what seems to be common publicly in the public eye of majority of the no- or the norm amongst certain individuals of a certain doctrine of a certain ideology who have some type of prestige, rather it be politically or in the religious spectrum as well. So what we gonna do? We gonna go to Isaiah chapter fourteen, and man, we gonna pick it up at verse twelve. And a lot of people have read this before. A lot, if you're in the Word, you're probably familiar with this. We're not going to address who we're to, who this is talking about in particular. We are going to notice the characteristics and the attitude. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and I'm reading from the KJV. How art thou thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. In the size of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Uh Uh-oh. Now, do we see this day to day? Like I said, we just don't see this on the grand scale of politics. But this type of attitude, this type of enticement also has come down to the religious spectrum as well. And one thing about it, I'm going I'm to read that one more time in verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, them high thoughts. You arrogant. You are narcissistic. I see dudes with the title of reverend act like this. Dudes with the title of elder act like this. Mr. Politician, rather be on the judicial board or the con- congressional or the Senate. We see this constantly with our leaders on a day-to-day basis living in America in this modern-day age. I thought a person in office, rather they be a politician or someone that's serving the people on a religious spectrum, are supposed to serve the people. Man, ain't that something? We reading right here in the scriptures that this type of attitude is something that the Most High has an issue with. So, LeVar, can you do me a favor? Can you turn to Proverbs? Let's see. Let me check real quick. Uh... Go to Proverbs chapter 16, if you don't mind, my brother. No, I don't mind. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to go somewhere. Yeah, you know, let me just say this real quick. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. You know, I, I love that you threw the spiritual leaders in there because it reminded me this one time where I was at church, and this pastor, he was a very elegant speaker. He was fiery. He was a great communicator, very boisterous. My kind of, you know, guy when it comes to delivering the word. But one thing threw me off. When this brother started talking about his silk sheets and his silk pajamas and all that stuff, I was done. And the reason why I was done, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having these things. I'm not saying that. But after he said that, Everything became about him. And what you just described, right there when you just read that scripture, it described a person who was very narcissistic, very sure of himself, very prideful. It's all about that person. And from the and, and from the time that preacher started talking about them silk pajamas, for the next 30 to 45 minutes, it became about his beamer. It became about hmm. his, his snakeskin shoes. It became about his snakeskin wallet. It became about uh, how he used to be a player, and he ain't no more. But then I was hearing all these rumors about him cheating on his wife, so he was really still a player. So this attitude that you're talking about, man, is very contagious, and it spreads like a cancer hmm. because – The second you see somebody puffed up like that, if you're the type of person that wants to be like that, you're going to gravitate towards that person. You you figure it's going to rub off on you because maybe, you know, you're materialistic. But a person like me, I was done. I sat there, I sat there, and I sat there, and I said, you know what, this is my last time I'm going to listen to this dude. But anyway, 
Proverbs 16 and what? Uh, pick it up at verse 18, my dude. I'll read just verse 18. All right. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride go up before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Mm. I'm going to read, now I'm going to read Isaiah 14 again. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And what did my brother just read? Read that one more again. Right. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Mm. Don't that line up? It lines up perfect. But check this out. Verse 15 of Isaiah chapter 14. Man, it's in a race. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the stars of the pit, that they shall, that they, I'm sorry, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of the prisoners? Mm-hmm. All the kings of the nations, even all of them lie in glory? Everyone in his own house? Man! You got to walking on water. You forgot you was on dry land. And you drowned. Mm. Mm. Or you thought you could walk on water, and you tried, and you sunk in. There's only one individual that walked on water. And his name is Yeshua the Christ, the master teacher. You know what it is. Man, right. <laughs> I just had to put that out there real quick. But my brother, so, go ahead. So, so let, let me let me get some of this real quick. So basically, what you just shown the people with those three places, we see a person may not be in leadership. Maybe he is right. He's prideful. He's puffed up. He's narcissistic. He's very prideful. But in the end. He falls. He's destroyed. Now, why is this important for the listening audience to understand? Are we saying Trump is going to fall? Not saying that at all. No, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is those are the ingredients of falling. The Bible is clearly letting you know and understand that being prideful, narcissistic, all the self-admiration, false humility, because I've been saying a lot of that on this show. I'm going to just keep it all the way 100 with you. Oh, boy. <laughs> once, once you start doing all that, you just taking all those ingredients. And I used to be a chef, y'all. Put them in that bowl, taking that spatula, or mm. whatever kids or two you got, you mixing it up in that bowl, and you put it in the oven. And you baking you a good old fall, mm. good old fashioned fall, right on your face. Look at past leaders that was like that. Um, some of them self destructed. I'm gonna give you one off the top of my head. His name was Adolf Hitler. You ever heard of him? Oh yeah, most so, deaf. So as far as Adolf Hitler goes, we've seen what a narcissistic attitude, a maniac of a narcissistic attitude, and a prideful attitude. Can get you. Last time I checked the history books, from what I've read, this man ended his own life. Or did he? Either way it goes, this man failed, along with his empire. Because he had to understand at the end that his system of government didn't work, and he had to understand he was just a man. People worshipped him. But at the same time, he ain't Yeshua the Christ, the only one who inhabit flesh, the only spirit to inhabit flesh that we as Messianic believers believe we should worship. And I want to say this real quick because there's no comparison to Adolf Hitler with Yeshua the Christ because a lot of, I've heard a lot being said on this particular platform, and I just want to say for the record that you guys did an excellent job when it came to defending the faith against the non-Messianic community or the Tanakh on the community. Excuse me. I know a lot of them don't like that. And the reason why I got to go ahead and give you, 
uh, Zaydad, Brother Josh, uh, Brother Anon, Anonymous Hebrew. I've got to give all you guys a lot of credit because you always stood your ground. We don't worship a man. We believe Christ existed before he inhabited flesh as God in heaven with all the other sons of God who are also God. And people don't understand that. But people tend to worship Trumps. They worship the, the Adolf Hitlers, the, the, the Joseph Stalins of the world, the Idi Amin's of the world. I mean, you name it. These guys are worshipped. And these people ran tyrannical governments, and the brother just laid out some scriptures to meditate on. You don't want to be like this. But at the same time, you got to pray for these people. Go ahead, brother. Man, dude. Man, when it comes to that, I'm going to just go to the next scripture, and then we're going to go into the meat of the convo. Turn to Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. We're going to pick it up at verse. We're going to pick it up at verse 23. And it reads. And I'm reading from the KJV, y'all. Who keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from trouble? Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He coveted greedily all day long, but the righteous give and spare not. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he bring it with a wicked mind? A false witness shall perish, but the man that heareth speaketh constantly. A wicked man harden his face. But as for the upright, he directed his way. Mm, let me read verse 30. There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. Amen. Man. It says, let's go back to verse 28, though. A false witness shall perish, but the man, oh, I'm sorry, my fault. Uh, what did I, no, it was something else I read that stood out. Uh, the wicked. What was? Oh wow! But he never should give a spirit. Not twenty-seven. The sacrifice of the wicked abomination. How much more when he bringeth the wicked mind? A false witness shall perish. But the yeah, I'm sorry. Speaks constantly. In other words, an individual that harden his face doesn't necessarily mean that dude just harden his face. It's talking about high looks. Arrogance, being cocky, having the narcissistic way of thinking. That's what that's talking about. That's considered to be wicked. That's what the Most High does not like. Man. That's one thing we got to remember. As And this is one thing about being a believer in the Most High. We are supposed to be the anchors. We are the ones who are supposed to bring these people back to reality. You can look in the prophets. When you read the prophets like Jeremiah, Hosea, Amos, who were they sent to to correct? When the people were out of order, there was a reason why. Because the leaders, the priests of those times. And what did the prophets always go do? You go to Jeremiah, you can read how he always addressed the leaders. Go to Hosea, he was addressing the leaders. Go to the prophet Amos, he was addressing the leaders. He told them, they were always told to repent. Things, these are things we, the people of the Most High, or the believers of the Most High, we are supposed to set the record straight when we see our leaders out of order. Because overall, the leaders are supposed to serve us. Mm-hmm. Mm. Now, this is what we're going to do. We're going to turn to the Apocrypha. Because I want to build our foundation in the meat of our conversation there. And for those who are not familiar with the Apocrypha, it's 14 books. It's 14 books that were originally in the 1611 King James. It's in the middle. And after that translation, it was removed. 
um, for those who don't have it, you can get an app online or you can um, buy one online. But we're going to start there. Wisdom of Solomon, Chapter 6. And the Apocrypha is some good knowledge in there, a lot of history, and a lot of uh, good writings that kind of remind me of Proverbs and Ecclesiastics and Psalms and things of that nature. We're going to pick it up at Wisdom of Solomon, Chapter 6. And it reads, and pick up at verse 1. Hear therefore, O ye kings, and understand, learn ye that be judges of the ends of the earth. Give ear that the rule of the people and glory in the multitude of nations. For power is given you of the Lord, or Yahweh, and sovereignty from the highest, who shall try your works and search out your counsels. Let's read verse 4, because I want to stop, I want to stop at verse 4. Because being ministers, uh-oh, that word ministers, of his kingdom, whose kingdom? Who that, LeVar, whose king, who's kingdom? God's kingdom. Man, ain't that something? Like the homeboy in New York be saying, uh, ain't that something? <laughs> but let's keep going. I'm going to read verse 4 again from the top. Because being ministers of his kingdom, you have not judged aright, nor kept the Torah, nor walk after the counsel of the Most High. Man, when you hear that word minister, now we know definition of words, they change over time. So I want to ask you a question real quick, LaVar. What is the definition of minister in this present day and age for the average person who's, for the average person who's under the leadership of somebody? The, uh, the definition to the average person who probably don't know no better, who's probably ignorant of the actual definition, uh, probably somebody to serve. Somebody to serve. Mm. But we know the actual definition of minister is servant. Uh oh. He's supposed to serve you. That's the true definition of a minister. Uh oh. Now, we know the Apocrypha is written in first century Greek. And for those who have a problem with Greek, that's crazy because we have believers who believe in the New Testament. But for some reason, they have a problem with Greek. Really, it's mine. It is really, it's really baffling to me. But that's a whole other conversation, though. But the thing is, is that I want to examine this word "ministers" in the Greek. I went to Liddell Scott's Greek lexicon. And I did some research, and then I'm gonna back it up with the Thayers and the homeboy Strong's. And according to Liddell Scott's. And it reads, the definition of minister is a servant, waiting man, a messenger. Hmm. Hmm, that sounds just about right, does it not? Yeah, that's it right there, bro. Right, right there. Now, let's go to the Strong's Concordance real quick. Uh... The number is 1249. Let's go to that real quick. I want to look at something here. You're going to see what the uh, homeboy Strong's got to say. And I say, yeah, the homeboy Strong's, I, I sure did say it. 1249. Give me a quick second, family. And the word is diakinos, or diak, for me, for those who speak Greek, forgive me, I'm butchering it, but for what I see, diakinos, if that's the proper word. If we have a caller that presses one that speaks Greek, please correct me on that. I don't mind being corrected. I don't have an attitude problem. But it reads, according to the homeboy Strong's, an attendant. A waiter. Hmm. Ain't that something? Teacher, pastor, a deacon, deaconess. 
I'm not even going to go there. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Minister. Hmm. So ministers are supposed to serve people in the kingdom. According to according to uh, wisdom of Solomon, chapter 6, I read it again, verse 4. Because being ministers of his kingdom, and this is talking about the kings, but we can also align this up with the priests, the pastors, the deacons, the bishops, the elders, and the so-called high priests. Mm. But do we see that? It's often in our communities when it comes to the religious spectrum. Do Not we see all. our pastors actually being servants for the people? Do we see our elders being servants for the people? Or do we see it the other way around? The people serving them. What you think, LaVar? What you see that's too often? Well, growing up in the Baptist church, I didn't know the true definition of minister growing up. And a lot of it has to do with what you're talking about. Again, it goes back to that preacher that I've seen on the podium talking about his silk drawers. Homeboy, I don't care about your silk drawers. I want to know about the word of God. And again, it came, it became all about him. And this is what this is what pimps do. They get inside your head psychologically. It's about me. It's about me. It's about me. It's about me. And guess what? You believe him when you don't know no better. And those of you who are young, just like myself, very impressionable, you know exactly where I'm coming from. Until you got older, you realize, like, this ain't where it's at. And I understood it then, but, of course, you're going because you got to go. But whenever that preacher would come in town, I would just tell my grandma now, like, look, man, I ain't trying to go. Like, it's something about him. And all of a sudden, I'm being an unruly child. No, this man is trying to serve his own belly. That's how the Bible talks about it. Mm. These people serve their own belly. And the whole point is, if the brother is breaking down for you guys, is if you're going to be a servant of God, you have to be willing to serve the Most High as his minister, as his servant. It reminds me of Deuteronomy chapter 10 and 17. It talks about the Lord is God of gods and the Lord of lords, great, mighty, and terrible, which regardless not persons nor taketh reward. Mm. You are to take on the nature of your God. This is what people don't understand. When you take on the nature of your God, that means you're not doing certain things that the rest of the world do. We're talking about politics here. Last time I checked, all these people were taking bribes. All this money is getting passed around, recycled, and circulated. When you take on the nature of your God and you want to be a servant or you want to be a minister, you can't be taking bribes. That's another aspect of the political mindset. You got all these back alley deals being done. You know, I've seen a lot of different politics growing up, even as a teenager. All of y'all who play sports know exactly what I'm talking about. You got a young man, right? He's 15 years old. He's a freshman. He's starting on varsity, starting point guard, right, on the basketball team. He averaging like 18 points as a freshman. His sophomore year, his numbers go up. He's averaging like 20, right? His junior year, right, he averaging like 24. Point guard, he done grew to about six foot six, right? Then his senior year, he grew up to about six foot seven. There's a coaching change. Guess what? That new coach, his son comes. His son is a little bit taller, can't shoot as well, can't dribble nowhere as good as the boy that's been starting since he's a freshman. But because of the politics, the new coach's son is starting over this one who was starting the past three years. Now, how does that happen? You see what I'm saying? So politics play a role in sports. Politics play a role in the spiritual community. Politics play a role in Hollywood, the entertainment industry. Y'all heard of Harvey Weinstein, right? What was his politics, sexual politics within Hollywood? Oh, you do me some sexual favors, you get on that TV show. That's politics right there. See, it ain't just, that's why I gave y'all the baseline definition when we first started, because the politics are the activities that help govern a nation, but they're also the activities that, that help 
govern or rule in all these different aspects of our lives, like I just broke down with the sports, like I just broke down in the entertainment field. It ain't just there, y'all. What about food politics? You know there's a lot of ignorant stuff going on when you're hearing about GMOs and all these types of things. These are food politics, man. You got people that don't want to, to let the soil rest so that we can get proper nourishment. Now it seems like nothing is real that we put in our body. You see what I'm saying? Mm. Politics range from sports, entertainment, all the way down to our religion and spirituality. And so what we need to understand is we cannot get so caught up in all these di- different activities that's going on behind closed doors. What we need to do is learn how to serve our God teach others who are struggling with their faith about our God. We have the power to do that. We don't tap into it enough. There's one reason why I didn't mind coming on the show with the brother is because I understood where he was coming from. I always like the man up series. And I'm definitely going to come back on here if you want me to. But the point where we're trying to show you guys is narcissistic people, they cannot be your minister, Right? You are to take on the nature of your God, which is helping to serve the people and not taking bribes. Because when you take bribes, you are easily swayed. You see what I'm saying? Women are very dangerous when it comes to men of power because women are powerful. And the things that we see in leadership today, a lot of this stuff is going on in the background is because of a woman. I've even seen that in high school. Oh, yeah. me too, bro. Me too, bro. That's not a bash at the sisters. We're not, we're not attacking none of the sisters. We got love for the sisters. We're just talking about how things are in the way of the world, which could be so cold. Well, I ain't attacking no sisters because I just said sisters are powerful. Right? Oh, most definitely. I agree with you. You know what I'm saying? But, but you know, there's people out there who may take it as just a shot. So we want to make sure... You know what I'm saying? We just be we being clean, and we just want to make sure there ain't nobody feeling that they don't get, they don't make it seem like we bashing anybody. You feel me? And I know you wasn't, brother, but I just had to clear it up because some people take it like that. In this day and age, you never know what it's anything is pop can pop off, no matter what. You feel me? Right. Well, I got much love and respect for my sisters. In fact, I came on this show a number of years ago, and I'm quite sure Sal will remember. I was uh, on here. Debating the brother, I can't remember his name, but I I was defending the position that a woman can teach within a church setting. I was defending that premise. So if anybody thinks that I have any uh, animosity or bias uh, against women, they they definitely mistaken because I believe that a lot of these sisters can teach better than a lot of these brothers I've heard, like. Sister Ashanti, she got a sharp sword. I got the utmost respect for her. I can listen to her all day because she studies. See, a lot of these brothers don't be studying, but they want you to listen to them. You can't be a servant being a a narcissist. And a lot of these guys are narcissists. They just want vain glory. We spoke about that earlier, that false humility. And a lot of this is going on in it's going on because we let it go on. Mm. And that's why I'm glad you guys named this man up. Because some of these, listen, I ain't with all the controversial and all the craziness. But a lot of times, man, I just be thinking to myself, and I agree, you know, some of us have a voice for teaching and some of us don't. But a lot of us need to just sit down somewhere. And this is why you don't hear my voice a lot. Because I'm more of a student than I am teacher, you know. I'm more of a sponge than anything. I like to soak up. I like to hear everybody because I believe everybody got something good to say. But at the same time, I'm going to pick a lane, and I'm going to sit in it. Go ahead, bro. Man, it's all about playing your position. But, man, I want to go to the actions of a servant. I want to go to an example of a king. Let's go to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 9. All right. Most deaf. Let's see what the king of Israel got to say. Known as the Christ. Let's see what he got to say. Mark chapter 9. And we're going to pick it up at verse 
uh, I'm going to say verse 30. And it reads, And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not, any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise on the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. And he came to Caprium, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed amongst yourselves by the way? And he asked them a question, his, his disciples, his tall ones. But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be the last of all and servant of all. Oh! That's a bomb. The servant of all, right? Well, man, the servant of all. And this is the king of Israel. The king of the set apart. This is out his mouth. Don't get mad at me. He said it. The mouthpiece of the Most High, known as Yeshua the Christ. Any comments, my brother, before I move on to the next scripture? I just want to say, just briefly, that I'm, I've always been proud of my belief. And I, I, I can't be even more prouder of my belief in what you just read about being, Yeshua being the servant of all. And in context, it really means all who will accept him. Because, see, you can't serve nobody that don't want to be served. You can't feed nobody that don't want no food. You see what I'm saying? Mm. You, you cannot guide somebody that don't want that guy. So what I'm saying is when, when you look at the whole totality of what you just read, uh, at some point you got to pick your minister, Right? And what I find really interesting is that, again, when I look on social media, when I look on Facebook, when I'm on YouTube and various other places, right, I see people picking so-called servants who ain't serving them nothing. This is what I'm seeing. I get a I, – I, I talk to a, a, a plethora of different people. You know what I'm saying? I like to hang out downtown sometimes, downtown Cleveland. I run into a lot of people. I've run into, you know, the Malachi Z York followers and the Pan-African guys and the the, uh, the Umar Johnson lovers. And, and out of all these people that I'm meeting, and I'm asking them, what is this particular person actually helping you with? How is he serving you? I get the the most ignorant answers like he's helping me to show me how powerful my melanin is. I don't understand what you mean by that. And every time I ask him, what do you mean by that? <clears throat> like that chemical inside your skin, I don't understand what you mean by that. I don't I don't get it. Because <clears throat> once again, we supposed to be a spiritual minded people. You're talking about the flesh. <clears throat> And didn't Christ say that if, uh, hold on, Christ said it, it's in the book of John, he said, uh, the flesh profit nothing, but it's the Not spirit that quicker that gives life. Anybody Not talking, any type of superiority, skin color complex, miss me. Go over, hit my line. Go ahead, Art. I agree with you 100%. And see, this is what I'm saying. These people are telling me that the Malachi Z. Yorks, the, the, uh, the leaders in the uh, black conscious movements, and all these guys, you know what I'm saying? These are their ministers. They're to serve them. You can have them. I want to pick Yeshua the Christ because he did something for me that they could never do. You understand? When I die, I believe he's going to be my intercessor. Malachi is a York can't be your intercessor. When I die, and the Most High Yah, when he sees me, he don't see me. He sees Christ, because I believe in Christ. When the so-called black Africanists, uh, Pan-African guys, when they die, 
The most high going to see them. He's not going to see Dr. Ben, okay? Dr. Ben can't be your lawyer for you. He can't present your case before the most high like Christ can. See, this is what these people don't understand. I understand completely where you're going with this. It was fabulous. Keep it coming, bro. Let's go to a chapter over. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And we're going to pick it up at verse uh, 40, what I want. Yes, 42. And it reads, Mark chapter 10, verse 42. But Jesus, or Yeshua, or Yahweh Shai, or whichever you prefer to call him, called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accomplished, accompted to rule over the Gentiles, exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And mm-hmm. whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life for a ransom for many. Mm. 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 <sighs> if I may. Go ahead, my dude. It's all love. If I may. See, in the beginning, we were talking about this prideful person. We were talking about this narcissistic individual. The reason why I can follow Jesus to Christ or Yeshua, because he's the complete opposite. Mm. He's saying right here that I didn't come to be served by y'all. I came to serve y'all and to give my life for a ransom for many. In context, that word many right there, that means the many who will accept him. Because keep it real, everybody ain't going to accept Jesus. We know that. So this doesn't apply to you because you ain't accepted him. You want to follow the Trumps, you want to follow the uh, Umar Johnsons, you want to follow all these narcissistic, attention-grabbing, prideful people. You go right ahead. It will profit you nothing. This is the ultimate minister right here. This is the ultimate servant right here because he, he has done something so great for us, and we don't care. All that New Testament, throw it in the garbage. Okay. That's your soul salvation. You, you've been taught. Brothers have been put in front of you, and you didn't take heed. Who are you really serving? That's my question. Who are you really serving? Mm. Who are you giving all your honor and praise to? I would like to know that. Because at the end of the day, whether you are a Messianic believer or not, you're going to have to answer to the Father. But does he see you, or does he see the ultimate minister, the ultimate servant? That's my question. Go ahead, bro. Man, you know what? We're going to go. We're going to, we most definitely finna break it down. We're going to go to the one, the most humble examples displayed. Turn to John chapter 13. And for those who are experiencing the word, you know where I'm going. And for those who are not familiar, sit back and soak up some of this game we finna spread coming from the Holy Scriptures. John chapter 13, right here. This is the ultimate display of being humble. Let's see if these so-called high priests, these so-called apostles, these so-called modern-day Self-titled prophets and pastors and any of these individuals with these high names and these, these, these characteristic and these vow attitudes who claim to come in the name of the Lord. Let's see if you're willing to do this. I'm going to pick it up. John chapter 13. We're going to go to verse 3. No, you know what? I'm going to go down some. 
I'm going to go to verse 4. No, verse 3. My fault. And it reads, Jesus knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he was come from the Most High and went to the Most High. He rises up, I mean, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took all and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. <sighs> Stick a fork in him. How many so-called high priests have done this already? How many pastors have done this? How many of us have done this? This is the ultimate example of humbling yourself. This is the master teacher washing his students' feet. But what do we see today in this society? This type of service being done to those with the titles. Totally contrary to how the Most High set things up. Man. Ain't that something? It's amazing to me that, you know, I, I read this article, right? And this was the ultimate form of humility, by the way, what you just read. Because, you know, most people ain't trying to do that. But I, I, I'll tell you, the people, churches have adopted this custom actually into their church homes around this nation. I know because I moved around a lot as a Navy kid growing up. And I've been to many churches and, and, and some, what they, what they call primitive Baptist churches, actually do the washing of the feet. They have women on one side of the church and the men on the other side of the church, and, and, and the women will wash the women's feet and the men will wash the men's feet. And they adopted this custom because they're trying to have that discipline of humility within themselves. And that's an honorable thing. But I find it really odd, and I, I'm going to explain this article I was reading about how the um, Su Supreme Court redefined marriage a couple of years ago. And, and this is what you would call gender politics, because we're not going to get away from what this is about at all, because we're going to tie all this together, of course, from what the brother is bringing forth through the Bible and, of course, uh, some of the secular things that I've been reading. But it's amazing to me how the Supreme Court of like five to seven uh, lawyers got together and 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 made this ruling, and um, they overruled the state's rights with this. And what's so telling about this is the fact that you have many Christian churches um, that wouldn't allow any homosexuals to have certain positions in their church, uh, but because uh, a gay individual might be related to someone that has a certain amount of clout in the church, whether it be a pastor, deacon, or deaconess, or whatsoever, they allow this individual to become a choir director or a media director, whatever position that they have in the church. They change the whole rules. They change the politics of the church uh, be, because of the Supreme Court ruling uh, back in, I want to say, about 2015. It, it changed the politics of the church. Let me tell you something about this humble servant that the brother just read about in John 13. This humble servant would never change the Most High's politics. In other words, the activities that govern the kingdom. <sighs> but you got a lot of that going on nowadays inside these churches. Even before this Supreme Court ruling came down, you had a lot of pastors in leadership doing this stuff, compromising because they didn't want to hurt somebody's feelings. You don't see the KKK compromising, okay, and letting black people into their organization. No, it's in their bylaws. No people of color. Well, the Most High has a Torah. He has laws, which is, to me, a more accurate translation would be teachings. And the teachings say that this type of individual who wants to do these things, back when there was a theocracy in Israel, they would be put to death. That's just the book. All of a sudden, the politics have changed, and that's fine. I get it. I understand. We're not under the theocracy of the Most High, but guess what? As the brother understands, and other brothers and sisters out there understand, there's going to be a theocracy again. What you going to do then? 
You ain't going to be able to bribe the most high, like I quoted in Deuteronomy 10 earlier. Mm. And you're not going to be able to get the son of the most high to change the politics of the kingdom in order to satisfy you. You're going to have to be humble. Again, take on the nature of your God. Yes, I can say that. The most high is the father. His son is God. I serve them both. Yes, I admit that. In the very nature of the Son of God, who is God Himself too, right? Mm. Humility. Humility. You take on that nature, and He didn't try to change anything that His Father put forth. Go ahead, bro. Man, that's powerful, my dude. That's powerful. I love that. But for those who are listening on the phone line, and who are listening. On the online service or on the on, on the website, if you would like to call in and chime in and build or speak on it, the number is area code three one nine five two seven six two three nine. Again, area code three one nine five two seven six two three nine. We would love to hear people's comments or hear their questions or observations. If you would like to, press the one. But until then, let's keep it moving. Let's turn back to Wisdom of Solomon, Chapter 6. Wisdom of Solomon, Chapter 6. We're going to pick it up at verse 5. After getting into what it means to be a minister of the kingdom of the Most High, now we're going to go into another aspect of it. And it reads, verse 5, Horribly and speedily shall he come upon you, for a sharp judgment shall be to them that be in high places. These are the individuals, like it said in verse 4, if you are not a minister and you are not walking contrary to the way of the Most High, then these things will happen to you. So I'm going to read it one more time, verse 5. Horribly and speedily shall he come unto you, Mr. Leader, Mr. Politician, High Priest, Apostle, Prophet, Preacher, huh? For a sharp judgment shall be to them that be in high places. Verse 6 For mercy will soon pardon the meanest, but the mighty man shall be mightily tormented. For he which is Lord over all shall fear no man's person, neither shall he stand in awe of any man's greatness. For he hath made the small and great. And care for all alike. Let's think about that real quick. Hold mm-hmm. on. Let me just won't read one more. But a sore trial shall come upon the mighty. The mighty. But before we get into the mighty, I'm gonna read verse seven one more time. Mm-hmm. For he is for he wishes Lord over all shall fear no man's person. Neither shall he stand in the, stand in awe of any man's greatness. For he had made the small and great and care for all alike. That means you have to be fair. That's right. As a leader. And we can read. Let's, you know what? Let's go to the Torah. Because everybody claims that they know Torah. I'm going to be honest with you. I would never, ever tell a person I know Torah. I'm a student of Torah. I'm there you go. learning Torah. There you go. I've been, let me just share this real quick before we go any further. I was raised a Baptist, and I came into this Israelite walk or this faith back in maybe 2006 or maybe late 2006, early 2007. And for a long time, I studied on my own before I came into the Internet community. And one thing I have always noticed is when I came into the Internet community, All I hear is Torah this and Torah that, and I know Torah, and I do Torah. Torah, 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 to the point I don't even like saying it anymore because every time I hear you boast about Torah, you've already butchered it and you're already messed up because the Torah talks about how you're not supposed to be boasting. We did a show with Zion Lex last season, and we proved that Torah is an action. In the book of Proverbs, it says, that the law or the Torah is a light, you will be judged or 
when people if people see that you're keeping Torah, it's not about how much fat mouthing you're doing. It's about the action. It's about the movement. Did you ever hear Christ talk about how much Torah he kept? Did you ever hear him talk about how much Torah did he keep or how much Torah did he teach? He never did. Did you hear Moses talk about, I keep Torah, 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 Torah? Did you hear the prophet Elijah talk about, I'm better than you and I keep Torah, 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 Torah? No, you didn't. Torah is an action. Stop fat mouthing and just do it. That's the message to the so called Hebrew Israelite who loves to run his mouth on Facebook and YouTube and various other platforms all over social media and the internet. But let's go to Exodus, the book of Exodus. And as we turn there, my man, you got any comments, my brother? Uh, I, can't, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you laid it out perfectly, man. And I agree that I am a student of Torah. I don't know at all. I have enough to direct people to Christ through it. I have enough of it to know that uh, it teaches me discipline. It teaches me temperance and self-control. I know enough of it to where I'm judged, uh, God God ain't going to take it easy on me. I'll put it to you like that. Mm. Because the more you know, the more you be held accountable. I'll just say it like that. But I, I do love God's word, and I'm constantly a student at it. I'm always willing to be taught. I'm all, I always look forward to the Sabbath lessons to learn more on it. And you just got to be humble, man. There's too many guys out here that, you know, preaching hate, but talking about they keep Torah. Anyway, go ahead. Man, like I said earlier in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, the Torah is a light. People see you from a distance. When you're a light, people see it from a distance. They see a light. So guess what? If you're going to preach Torah and Torah over and over and over, make sure you're doing it because you will come up fault at fault if you don't keep it. I mean, if you don't, if you, if you oh, I'm getting tired of time, my fault. If you continue to speak about how much Torah you keep, just make sure you're doing it. <laughs> but let's go to Exodus chapter 23. And we're going to pick it up in verse 6. Thou should not rest the judgment of thy poor in his cause. Hmm. Keep thee far from a false matter. And the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I would not justify the wicked. Verse 8 is a kicker. And thou should take no gift, for the gift blinded the wise and perverted the words of the righteous. Mm. There you go. There you go. Hold on. And let me just let me just do one more because um, <laughs> verse nine. <laughs> let me do it. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can go ahead and have it, Brett. Also, thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. That speaks volumes. Go right yeah, ahead, brother. It's it's amazing that people. Uh, want to change the definition of what a stranger was back then, but that's neither here nor there. I like verse number eight because, it, and it's not like me and this brother like sat down and got some scriptures together. That's not how this happened. He said he's going to present some stuff. I said I was going to present some stuff. And verse eight says, "And thou shalt take no gift." For the gift blinded the wise and perverted the words of the righteous. Now, what did I just say earlier? I quoted mm. Deuteronomy 10. In a nutshell, take on the nature of your God. Don't take bribes. Because it said you can't bribe God. This is saying don't take no bribe. Don't take no gift, no bribe. So this, this right here speaks volumes about a person in leadership who says he's going to serve the people. You can't serve nobody when you're taking gifts. Because it's going to pervert your words And when it perverts your words We already know if your words is jacked up Your actions is jacked up You're telling people that you're going to do something for them And you're lying mm. You're lying How many times have we seen politicians Get up on podiums In front of the whole nation And say what they're going to do And it was nothing but empty promises 
So, in a nutshell, you can't be a true servant if you take your gifts and bride. Just exactly the point I was bringing up earlier. Go ahead, bro. And you know what? Torah should never be preached or used as a sword. You're supposed to just do it. It's supposed to be liberty in Torah. It's supposed to be freedom in Torah. Justice in Torah. We're always bickering at the Christian. You got to keep Torah. The Christian will never keep it, especially when you display a weak version of it. That's always fat mouthing about how much you're keeping. Let's go to Luke chapter 19. I'm sorry, not Luke. Leviticus chapter 19. My fault. Getting a little too jumpy there. Leviticus chapter 19. And we're going to pick it up at verse 15. We all read this before. But for some reason, I don't see this being displayed very often. So let's find out what it says from the Torah itself. Because Torah does stand. But then all of a sudden, we tend to see the opposite with the actions. And the action speaks louder than words. And remember, Torah is an action. And the Spirit manifests through action. Because Torah comes from the Supreme Spirit known as Yah, or El Elyon, or whichever you prepare to call him. And it reads, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou should not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Mm. That spoke, that speaks volumes again. Powerful information. And notice, in this day and age, it's common for Mr. Politician and Mr. So Self-Righteous Religious Leader to, to, to show respect to a person for the mighty. Are you familiar with that term in the Bible called the mighty, Brother LeVar? Yeah, I'm somewhat familiar with it. And the thing is, we understand who the poor are. Mm-hmm. Who are the mighty? The rich. Ooh. There you go. Let's go back to politics. In a race. Let's see. When it comes to the American system, we are under a system that is called fascism. Fascism is a doctrine which is contrary to democracy, which America claims to be under. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the dictionary and look up fascism because I want to build something real quick. Fascism. Yeah, uh, so go ahead, my brother. I say it again. Oh, I was about to say, go ahead. That's cool. And after you do the fascism, I'm going to uh, break down democracy. Most definitely. And it reads in the dictionary, fascism, a political philosophy, movement, or regime that exalts nation and race above the individual and that stands for a centralized autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader. Severed economic, severe economic and social regiments and forcible suppression of opposition, a tendency, a tendency towards or actual exercise of strong autocratic or dictatorial control, an autocratic dictatorial control, brutality. Also, another fascism also is a doctrine when the corporate and the state merge and they become one. And the state represents the government, and the corporate represents big businesses. And right now, in this day and age, dude in office, Donald, he is the manifestation of fascism in the flesh. But it didn't start with him. It goes to the one before him, and the one before, and the one before. A rapper by the name of Immortal Technique once said about the president before Donald, and he said that the individual, you know who he is, don't have to say his name, that he was fascism given to us with democratic packaging. Eldridge Cleaver of the Black Panther Party said, when fascism comes to America, it's going to be wrapped up as super patriotic. It's going to be nice. It's going to be given to us with a sucker. 
Think about it. Who has control in the country? Who gets all the benefits? Is it the rich, the proletariat, or the working class, or the mighty, the strong, those who have wealth and who controls the means of production? We are involved in a war of classism. Yes. Mm. Now, I'm going to allow Brother uh, LeVar to break down democracy, and then I want to get into a little bit more of fascism. And we're going to show that fascism is totally contrary to the scriptures. Go right ahead, my brother. In the U.S., we are considered citizens that are members of a democracy. The word democracy is from the Greek demos, which means the people, and krasia, meaning power and rule. So you're trying to tell me the people, as in, you know, the lower class, which we would be considered, you know, the non-rich, we rule this country? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, because here in America, the system of government and rulership was founded on the principle that the citizens can decide through voting on the issues and on the individuals that would represent the leadership from among ourselves. So they're saying basically this whole idea of a democracy is the fact that people vote and we choose a leader from among ourselves, which makes us a democracy. So uh, in the whole total context of the whole situation, since we're deciding on the leader, we're actually uh, helping form the system of power and rule. And my thing is, and a lot of you might agree, and might, a lot of you might not disagree, but the most high picks the president. I don't care what nobody got to say. That's just the truth. Who's ever in power is because the most high allowed it. You can say what you want. You can huff and puff. You can complain. And my thing with this whole uh, show we're trying to present to you guys is you cannot allow who's ever in leadership to influence your spirituality. Because once you do that, you're forgetting about who is the ultimate servant, which is Jesus Christ, and who you are supposed to be serving, which is the lost sheep who needs uh, that rod to come guide them to him. Right, you in your own right are supposed to be out here gaining more souls. I know I definitely try. I'm not saying I'm doing the best job I could be doing. I'll be totally honest with you, but at the same time, it's a part of my lifestyle. It is 100%. It's a part of my lifestyle, and you cannot allow this whole voting and our vote really doesn't count. And I see so many comments all over social media about how we don't really pick the president and he's already been chosen and all this stuff and who got the popular vote. Is it a blue state? Is it a red state? Is it the right or he's on the left or he's bipartisan or all this stuff. You're focused on the wrong thing. The most high than already got this scripted out. And you just got to play your role. And this is what people don't understand. No, I don't get caught up in voting and all that stuff. I just recently... Um, been allowed the privilege to vote because I was a felon most of my adult life. I, you know, I was out in the streets. I was doing all kind of wrong stuff. Mm. The point I'm trying to make is don't focus on that stuff too much. People are all over Facebook making these videos. I'll never forget. Uh, I think it was last year around about this time, it was this girl on there talking about store up water, this and this and that. Something's going down October 13th or something crazy she's saying. And a whole bunch of people was believing her like she was a prophetess or something like that. Nothing happened. Everything went on as normal. When President Trump got elected, everybody trying to head for the hills, everybody trying to leave America and all this stuff. Relax. This is called fear-mongering. You don't allow all this stuff to influence your spirituality, to binding and connecting to your creator. Well, go ahead, bro. Man, 
Now, there are 14 characteristics of fascism. I'm just going to go into a few of them. And let's see, all of us who are listening, rather be on the phone line, on the blog, talk radio website, the recorded um, on the recorded um, audio, or on the YouTube channel. Let me know if these sound familiar to you. If they do sound familiar to you, please press one if you want, if you would like to. But the first one I want to talk about is this. And Lavar, let me know if this sounds very familiar to you. Corporate power is protected. And let me read. The industrial and business aristocracies of a fascist nation often are the ones who put the government leaders into power, created a mutually beneficial business-government relationship and power elite. Doesn't that also line up with the dude who's in office right now? 100%. Mm, 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 mm. Let's go to another one. I know this sounds familiar to a lot of y'all. Let's keep going. Supremacy of militancy or the, or the military, even when there are widespread domestic problems. Hmm, I'm not going to get into that. The military is given a disproportionate amount of government funding, and the, the domestic agenda is neglected. Soldiers in military service are glamorized. Hmm. Let me go to one that lines up with it, that, that, that goes hand in hand with it. And it reads. Powerful and continuing nationalism. Fascist regimes tend to make constant use of patriotic mottos, slogans, symbols, songs, and other paraphernalia. Flags are seen everywhere, as are flag symbols on clothing and public displays. Does this line up with the protests and the NFL players and Donald Trump? There we go. That's it. Mm. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Controlled mass media. Sometimes the media is directly controlled by the government, but in other cases the media is indirectly controlled by the government regulations or sympathetic media spokespersons and executives. Censorship, especially in wartime, is very common. Controlled media. Uh what does Donald Trump like to call it? Fake news? Yep. Yep. Let's keep going. Um, Rapid sexism. The government or fascist nations tend to be almost exclusively male-dominated. Under fascist regimes, traditional gender roles are made more rigid. Divorce, abortion, homosexuality are suppressed, and the state is represented as the ultimate guardian of the family Institution. Doesn't the individual once say he likes to grab women, grab women by their what? We ain't gotta go there, bro. See that? <laughs> gotta keep it clean. <laughs> gotta keep it clean. <laughs> I apologize, my brother. Most deaf. <laughs> and then we'll go to one more, or uh, maybe two more. Fraudulent elections. Sometimes elections in a fascist nation are a complete sham. Other times elections are manipulated by smear campaigns against or even assassination of opposition. I'll go nah and I'll leave it at that. Rigged elections. Mm-hmm. Talks about what what's what's dude's name before Obama in the recount. Uh oh. Yeah. And one more. The police is called obsession with crime and punishment. Under fascist regimes, the police are given almost limitless power to enforce laws. The people are often willing to overlook police abuses and even forego civil liberties in the name of patriotism. This is often national police force with verbal unlimited power in a fascist nation. Doesn't that sound familiar? All too familiar with, or I hate to say it, people of color in this so-called great nation. Mm. And as you can see, these characteristics are out there. And I know a lot of people can identify with them. They either have witnessed it themselves, personally, or they can see it from a distance. But, never, but no matter what, it's evident, and it's right there. 
and our government officials, along with our religious people, are turning the blind eye to it. Not all of them, but a good portion of them are turning the blind eye. If Yeshua the Christ was walking around this modern-day era, he would correct it and call it out for what it is. If the Bible prophets were walking around in this modern-day time, they would call it out for what it is. If Moses was walking around in this day and age, he would call it for what it is. What do you think Moses was doing when he walked through Egypt? You think he was walking around, jumping in at a party? He walked into an empire, a feudal empire, and he was walking amongst his enemies. What do empires do? Empires rule over the poor. They rule over their citizens, and they subject them to unjust laws, to where a few gain and majority are lacking. Historically, you can prove that. We can prove this. Look up feudal Egypt. A lot of information is there. Line it up with Moses and read the book of Exodus and understand that when the Most High destroyed Egypt, what did he destroy Egypt with? What, I mean, what did he destroy that made Egypt powerful? The natural resources, the crops, the animals, the water, the very few things that made Egypt into a national powerhouse, the Most High used it to destroy it till there was nothing left. Anything else, my brother? Well, just to piggyback off your point, and people wonder how Egypt became a superpower, how America became a superpower. They did the same thing pretty much what China is doing right now. After what, 1812, what happened was, well, that, by the way, that was a war that uh, the United States almost lost. And the reason why is because they didn't provide their soldiers with shoes. They wasn't mass producing the shoes and the weaponry and all these things. So after that war was over, what happened was uh, uh, the, the leaders at that time pretty much understood that no only way we can uh, gain power or, you know, be a self-sufficient nation is if we take our raw materials and start using them as goods and services to trade around the world. And this is how, this is the beginning or the genesis of how America came to power and become a superpower it is. I mean, you see the technological advances today that America has with its weaponry, you know, the planes, everything we have, you know what I'm saying? It all started from that point. And so what the brother just described was Egypt at a time being the superpower when the Most High took away those raw materials, their crops, everything they had. I mean, America had cotton and all these things that America had. When those things are taken away, you do what? You fall. Because see, what happened with the king of Egypt at that time? Well, the brother read earlier what his mindset was, I will ascend above the clouds, I will be like the most high. See, that was the type of attitude Pharaoh had. He was prideful. You see what I'm saying? Uh, the, the book lines up with everything that we're saying right now. And once you become narcissistic, prideful, so on and so forth, the most high will, lower, will, will, will bring you low based on the things that he blessed you with in the first place. He'll take those things from you, and he'll flip it on you, and next thing you know, you're going to see famine, you're going to see death, you're going to see disease, you're going to see hunger. Go ahead, bro. Mm. Let's turn to Psalms chapter 10. And before we read Psalms chapter 10, we have one caller. So, LeVar, you mind taking the caller real quick, and then we can move on to Psalms chapter 10? Go ahead. All right, Sal. Let's do it. All right, we're going to the phone line, Stanley. Uh, if you already have called in, just simply press number one, and we'll add you in. If you're listening on the internet, you have to dial that number three one nine five two seven six two three nine, and press number one. That lets me know that you have a question or a comment. Remember, for those those, those that are new to the show, you got to keep it clean, keep it professional. Let's go to five one zero nine one seven. You're live. Uh, hey, uh, shalom, everybody. This is uh, Vinny D. Uh, happy Yo. happy uh, day of atonement to y'all. <laughs> What's happening? What's up, oh, my man. dude? What's up, town business? <laughs> oh, not much, you know. Hey, I'm just uh, calling in to support the show. I've been listening in, and uh, I've been uh, vibing with what y'all been saying. You know, it, what makes me think about it is like when the people of power, when Christ came, how the uh, the people are in charge over Israel, they didn't want 
Christ to, uh, you know, they wanted to shut them up because they knew that it would take away their power, you know. And I think that the system that, you know, these American politics is a system that is set up just to keep the people that's on top on top, kind of like how the uh, Pharisees and all them was. So right. I think, personally, I think that they they go against the laws or basically the instruction because they know that once the people get a hold of those, then it'll turn, and then just by default, everybody will stop even dealing with them. So I think that, you know, that's the – I think it's a conspiracy. I think it's a main it's a main goal of them to to you know stamp that out because then they can they can remain in power and then it also keeps the vision. You know it's it's it's, it's a real smart system and I, I don't even deal with it to be honest. I listen and then I follow it a little bit, but I, I don't get wrapped up into it. You know because I, I think the the best vote that we got is a uh, is a uh, is a uh, is a uh, uh, keeping the commandments. You know. Or you know, dealing with the instructions that were set before us. Smart man. And that, Smart that's man. about he, all I had to say. <clears throat> Thanks, Thank brother Vinny, man. Brother. Like always, much right. love to you. Yeah, shalom to all y'all, uh, Sal. Uh, welcome back, brother Lavar, uh, brother B A. Uh, good build. I uh, holla at y'all. So, Ark, right, much love. All right. Any more callers, Sal? All right, family, once again, at number is 319-527-6239. We have a lot of people standing by checking out the show. But, again, if you have any questions or comments, just press number one. Or, alternative, send me an email, debatetalkview at gmail.com. That's debatetalk number four and the letter U at gmail.com. And I'll gladly read out your question to the host and the special guests. Uh, nobody else pressing number one at this time. I'll keep you posted. Go ahead. All right, for sure. And the one thing about it is, it's not that we're keeping up with the modern day circus on television. These are things. Um, these are things that we are noticing from an overall perspective. We're not keeping up with the daily, but the system is corrupt. And as believers in the Most High, we have to call it out for what it is. So, I would like for us to turn to Psalms chapter ten. I want to look at something, because we were talking about the mighty, the rich, those who are getting the benefits in this government today, in this system today. Psalms chapter 10. Mm -hmm. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. Why Mm -hmm. standest thou far off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doeth persecute the poor. Uh Uh-oh, there go that word pride again. Mm -hmm. Read verse 2 again, read it one more time. The wicked in his pride doeth persecute the poor. Let them that be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire, and blessed the covetousness whom the Lord abhorred. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far about of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall be never I shall never be an av- adverse adversary adversity. An adversity, I believe. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in lurking places of the villages, and the secret places doeth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privately set against the poor. Wow. Think about it. If we're talking about the poor, what is the psalmist, the writer that is recording what King David is saying? Who could we identify who the wicked are the rich now we don't have a problem with being rich but being rich and having great wealth becomes a problem when you're consumed by greed exactly man when greed is at an all time high 
in this country and everywhere else, it becomes a problem. And we got another caller. So let's just, uh, if you don't mind, LeVar, before we go to that caller, you got any comments on that? Yes. Consumerism is a religion Mm. in today's modern America. Go ahead. Most deaf consumerism. Look that up. There's a song by Lauryn Hill called Consumerism. It's very powerful. I suggest everybody listen to it. It's real deep and it's real powerful. So, Sal, let's go to that caller real quick. All right, once again, family, it's the Man Up segment right here on the Base Talk for you. For those that are joining in, today's show is entitled American Politics and Its Influence on Spirituality. My special guest is LeVar Maven. Of course, the show is hosted by VA. The number is 319-527-6239. By the way, family, we have 10 minutes on the air. We have 10 minutes on the air. What that means is if you're listening on the Internet, if you're listening via social media, once that time runs out, the only way you can hear the rest of the show is by dialing in. Again, if you want to hear the rest of the show in the overtime portion, you have to call in before that time runs out. We have 10 minutes on the air. So, again, the number to call in to hear the rest of the show, 319-527-6239. You should put it on speed dial by now on your phone. <laughs> but uh, nobody's standing by right now. You can continue. Okay. So, as we can see, the rich eat the poor when they're consumed by greed. Let's go to James chapter 2. We're going to go to the apostles. Yep, I said it. We're going to go to the apostles. We're going to go to James chapter 2. And we're going to see what the apostle has to say. And you know, we're in the era where people hate the New Testament. But let's see what James has to say. James chapter 2, we're going to pick it up in verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Yeshua Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of person. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man and vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that worth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sittest thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit under my footstool. Mm. Are ye mm. not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, have not God chosen the poor to this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme and worthy do not I'm sorry, verse seven. Do not they blaspheme the worthy name but which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. But if you have respect of persons, Ye commit sin and are convinced the law, and you are convicted of the law of transgression. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, say also, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Any comments, my brother? Yeah, I would just like to say our beloved brother James here has said a a mouthful from what you just read. And what he's doing is he's putting uh, the downtrodden, the poor, up on a pedestal because he knows society at large won't do that. Uh, meaning those in your leadership. And what he is doing is he's giving honor to the poor. He's giving honor to those who have not had all those material possessions and the money and the gold and all these things that these people have and the nice clothing. He's giving these people a voice because this is what Christ taught. And once you start being a respecter of persons, meaning 
you start favoring uh, rich people over poor people and being biased towards the rich, uh, once you do that, that means you commit sin. And what we have in this country is we have celebrities and the rich elevated as the elite of the society. And these people are nothing but adulterers. A lot of these people are just drug addicts, you know what I'm saying, man whores, what have you. And we praising these people like they are gods. And the fact of the matter is a lot of these people have a lot of insecurities within themselves. They get behind closed doors, and these people are rich, and they heat themselves up as gods and goddesses. And you see them all over uh, YouTube and videos and smoking the weed and I got all my gold on and all this stuff. You can see them in your local churches. You know, the, 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 they call them the trap kings and queens out here. And once one of their homeboys or homegirls get killed, you see them smelling like weed in the church. You come, come in the sanctuary, the whole church smells like weed. They sitting in the front pew with a slurpee. You know what I'm saying? These people have heaped themselves up as the elite in society. They on the Oscars. They on the big screen. They everywhere. They in Hollywood. The whole point is these people are not gods. And once you start being biased towards them, you commit a great sin because the people who have a better chance of getting in the kingdom because they're humble are the poor. Go ahead, bro. Powerful, my brother. Let's turn back to Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 6. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 6. About to get ready to close out and wrap it up in a tad bit. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 6. And we're going to pick it up at verse 9. And it reads, Unto you, therefore, O kings, do I speak that ye may learn wisdom and not fall away. Let's get into this wisdom. Let's see what it says for those who choose wisdom. For they that keep holiness, holy the holy, shall be judged holy. And they that have learned such things shall find what to answer. Wherefore, set your affections upon my words, desire them, and ye shall be instructed. Wisdom is glory, and never fadeth away. Yea, she is easily seen of them that love her, and found of such as seek her. She preventeth them that desire her, and maketh herself first known unto them. Whoso seeketh her eagerly shall have no great travail, for he shall find her sitting at his doors. To think therefore upon her is perfection of wisdom, and whoso watch for her shall quickly be without care. For she goeth about seeking such as are worthy of her, showing herself favorably unto them in the ways, and meeteth them in every thought. For the very true beginning of her is the desire of discipline, and the care of discipline is love. And love is the keeping of her laws, and the giving heed unto her laws is the assurance of is is the assurance of incorruption. Mm. Ain't that something? Verse 19. And incorruption maketh us near unto God. Therefore, desire of wisdom bringeth into a kingdom. If your delight be then in thorns and scepters, O ye kings of the people, honor wisdom that ye may reign forevermore. 22. As for wisdom, what she is is how she came up. And I tell you, and will not hide mysteries from you, but will seek her out from the beginning of her nativity. Bring the knowledge of her into light and will not pass over the truth. Neither will I go with, with I'm sorry, verse 23, and read that again, got kind of tongue-tied. Neither will I go with consuming envy, for such a man shall have no fellowship with wisdom. But the multitude of wisdom is the welfare of the word, and a wise king is the upholding of the people. Receive therefore instruction throughout my words, and it shall be and it shall do you good. Mm. Mm-hmm. You see that? Mm-hmm. 
see how much wisdom is for the king, for the leader, for the so-called religious or spiritual leader? Wisdom would take you a long way with the most high. Mm-hmm. Doesn't it say, I, Luke? I'm sorry, go ahead, brother. Oh, I'm saying I agree, and I got some wisdom to read, too, if you don't mind. Oh, go right ahead, my brother. The floor is yours. Just real quick, I love this. Uh, sixth chapter of the wisdom of Solomon because it's breaking down wisdom and it's breaking down the influence of wisdom on what it is and how it relates to somebody in leadership and I love why the brother brought this out because earlier I was saying a couple things I said number one you shouldn't be mad about who's in office because the most high put them there uh, Romans three thirteen and 1 says let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. That's some wisdom for you right there. Okay, and this is why I said you ought to pray for Donald Trump. Out of all the things that we said about him, we ain't lying on the man, but this is why you should pray for Donald Trump. Let's go to Proverbs 21 and 1, and it says, The king's heart is in the hand of of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turns it whithersoever he will. So this is why you should pray for Donald Trump is so that his heart can be controlled by the Most High. If if his heart is in the Most High's hand, he'll make better decisions. All those ignorant things that he said, he'll be apologetic about it. And guess what? He'll be sincere about it. And not only will he be sincere, you will have to understand that everybody used to have a dark heart for the most part. We all have been there. And all of us need forgiveness and all of us need sanctification. You cannot act like you are so high and mighty that you have never done anything in your life. You have to be able to pray for those who you don't agree with in leadership. First Timothy uh, 2 and 1 says, Exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intersections, and giving of thanks be made of all men. Verse 2, For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Intercessions be made for kings. That's prayers. So we got to understand that it's not what we want. It's what the Most High wants. It's not what we think we should be doing. It's what he said we should be doing. And these are the apostles, uh, Paul, and I read from um, Proverbs. If you believe the Bible, then you got to roll with that. You can't sit up here and act like, oh, well, that don't apply to me. I don't care what you say. He racist. Yeah, he, he may be a racist, yeah. But it's a lot of people that used to be racist ain't racist no more. And guess what happens? That's the power of God right there. Go ahead, bro. Man, powerful words, my brother. And my man Sal, just want to ask you real quick: We got any callers? Press the one. Are we are we still uh, got a? Are we just still? Uh, I mean, we got any callers? Yourself. Uh, hello. Yeah, I'm still here, brother. Oh, Sal be taking these trips away from the phone sometimes. You know how he do. Yeah, he probably uh had to step away for a quick second. All right, what we gonna do? Let's see here. Man, like I was saying earlier, wisdom would take us a long way if we do it properly. We know wisdom is a gift and the characteristic of the Most High. It's something that he gives to man. It also said that Yeshua, he grew in wisdom. So for him to be the righteous ruler of Israel and to be king and priest, he had to have, he had to rule in wisdom while he was here on earth to earn his eternal position in sitting in the throne mm-hmm. of the world. Go ahead, bro. No, I was going to say that I agree and. I'm telling you, man, there's there's no shortage of thoughts that I have about this because, you know, 
I, I read an article about a young teenager, and this is educational politics right here. Mm. She was a straight A student, um, you know, a bright student. She's a person of color, but um, they had a problem with this young sister's hair. Who in the world is voting in legislation to ban natural hair in politics? Talking about it's a distraction. Is that wisdom right there? Is that sound doctor? This this is straight A student right here. And they're telling her, Oh, you can't wear your hair like this. It's a distraction and all this type of stuff. And see, this is this is another uh part of racial politics too, because they try to make everything about certain people wrong. Like it's natural. It's natural and it's God given, but they try to make it wrong and try to make laws against it. Is this wisdom? Does that does that sound like sound doctrine to you? I mean, again, this there's no choice of stories like this all across America where you have Harvard discrimination discriminating against Asians at that particular university. Why? Because Asians are testing higher than any other race of people and what they're doing is they're setting the bar higher. Well, I won't even say higher. What they're doing is changing the politics within the university. Now you got to sit down and get interviewed, and if and if you're not what they call, uh, I can't remember the term they use, but if you if you don't have a particular character base that they're looking for, no matter how high you score, and you're an Asian, you can't come to Harvard. These are facts. You can look this stuff up. So now these racial politics, this is not wisdom, man. You know what I'm saying? And, and and the reason why I'm bringing this stuff up is because this country has been a cesspool of hatred towards certain people, and it's been a cesspool of ignorance, and they're just making up laws as they go along, like I mentioned earlier about changing the definition of marriage. Marriage has always been a public institution between a man and a woman. If, if uh, people of, of, of same-sex relations... Uh, want to be together, okay, you you can't have five lawyers redefining the terms based upon the sensitivity of people, especially when they say that this co- this country was founded upon biblical pr- principles. But I ain't going to rant too much more. Go ahead, bro. <laughs> it's funny how you say the country was built on biblical principles where they claim. They say it was built on the Ten Commandments, but as you can see, that's, that's very awesome. contrary. Yeah. So Sal, you made it back, my man. Sal and took a vacation to Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he out there in Brooklyn doing his thing, though. I love Sal, my brother. Well, man, this is what I want to do. I want to get back. I want to talk about a cult following because we're dealing with our politicians and our religious leaders. I'm going to read an excerpt from a book that I read 13, 14 years ago. I was walking in the bookstore, and this book caught my attention. It was an orange and blue book, and it caught my attention. And ever since I read it, since then, I've been hooked because I can see how this book is systematically being used on us, on our people, on all people in society today. It's called The 48 Laws of Power. A lot of people are familiar with that book. And we're going to go to Law, Chapter 27. Law. It's called Law 27. And the name of the law is play on people's need to believe to create a cult like following. And it starts with judgment. And as I read some, brother, I'll take a pause and you can expound if you would like. All right, my bro? That's fine. And after this, we're going to pretty much wrap it up. And it says judgment. And it reads people have an over- overwhelming desire to believe in something. Become the focal point of such desire by offering them a cause, a new faith to follow. Keep your words vague, but full of promise. Emphasize enthusiasm over rationality and clear thinking. Give your new disciples rituals to perform. Ask them to make sacrifices on your behalf. In the absence of organized religion and grand causes, your new belief system will bring you untold power. Hmm, that sounds familiar, does it not? Yes, it does. <laughs> Let's keep going. 
the science of the charlatism or how to create a cult in five easy steps, check this out. Peep game, all right? And peep game to the audience. And much love to those tuning in. And searching, as you must, for the methods that will gain you the most power for the least effort, you will find the creation of a cult-like following, one of the most effective. Having a large following opens up all sorts of possibilities for deception. Not only will your followers worship you, they will defend you from your enemies and will voluntarily take on the work of enticing, of enticing others to join the fledging cult. This kind of power will lift you to another to another realm. You will no longer have to struggle or use sabotage to enforce your will. You are adored and can do no wrong. You might you might think it as a gargantuan task to create such a following, but in fact, it is fairly simple. As humans, we have a desperate need to believe in something anything in, in, in something anything. This makes us eminently gullible. We simply cannot endure long periods of doubt or of the emptiness that comes from the lack of something to believe in. Dangle in front of us some new calls, XLR, get rich, get, get rich quick scheme, or at least technological trends or art movement, and we leap from the water as one to take the bait. Look at history, the chronicles of the new trends and cults that have made a, I mean, made a mass following for themselves. Could fill a library. After a few centuries, a few decades, a few years, a few months, they generally look ridiculous. But at the time, they seemed so attractive, so transcendental, so divine, always in a rush to believe in something. Mm-hmm. We will manufacture yeah. saints and face out and faith out of nothing. Do not let guilt. I'm sorry. Hold on. Do not let the guilt to li- the guilt liability go to waste. Make yourself the object of worship. May people form a cult around you. The great European charlatans of the 16th and 17th centuries mastered the art of cult making. They lived as we do now in a time of transformation. Organized religion was on the wane. Science, of the, science on the rise. People were desperately to rally around a new cause of faith or faith. The charlatans had begun by peddling health, exiliars, and, alchem- and, and alchemic shortcuts to wealth. Moving quickly from town to town, they originally focused on small groups until, until by accident they stumbled on a truth of human nature. The large, the large group they gathered around themselves, the easier it was to deceive. The charlatan was stationed himself on a high wooden platform, hence the term mountain bank. And crowds would swarm around him, and a ground setting people were more emotional, less able to reason. Had the charlatans spoken to them individually, they might have found him ridiculous, but lost in the crowd, they got up from the, com- from the communal mode of rapid attention. It became impossible for them to find a distance to be skeptical. Any deficiencies in the charlatan's ideas were hidden by the zeal of the mass. Passion and enthusiasm swept through the crowd like a contagion, and they reacted vitally to anyone who dared to spread a seed of doubt. But consciously studying this dynamic over decades of experiment and spontaneously adapting to these situations as they happened, the charlatan perfected the science of attracting and holding a crowd, molding the crowd into followers and followers into a cult. I want to stop right there. Any comments, mm-hmm. my brother? Well, number one, it reminded me of Jim Jones, um, mm. Jonestown in South America, where he was able to persuade a plethora of people to kill themselves, and these people were vigorously indoctrinated by him. Second, it reminded me of the past two years where if you say one bad thing about Trump to one of his followers, uh, you might get attacked depending on the circumstances. Those are the first two things that what you just read to me reminded me of. Mm, This this also lines up in the religious world as well. Speak out of it. Go ahead. 
Oh, well, that's why I said Jim Jones first because mm-hmm. he started out in a church and he was influenced by uh, the Bible, so on and so forth. But he got his start in the church, and through all his indoctrinations, he did use the Bible. Go ahead. Mm. And Sal just came back in, and we have another caller. Let's address that caller real quick before we move on. Go ahead, Sal. Do your thing, all right? All right, 213, you're live, 213. Yo, 213. 213, 400, you're live. 213, that's, uh, that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's L.A. <laughs> so the sounds like. Yeah, I guess the, uh, 213, I guess they're not hearing anything. I guess we'll come back. 213, 400, are you there? Going once, going twice. All right, we have to move on. Continue, guys. All right, let's see. It was, and I'll keep reading. It was to the charlatan's advantage that the individuals predisposed to credibility should multiply, that the groups of its adherents should enlarge to mass proportions, guaranteeing an ever great greater scope. For his triumphs, and this was in fact to occur, as science was po- polarized from the Renaissance and down through succeeding centuries, with the immense growth to note, I mean, ah, with the immense growth of knowledge and its spread through printing. In modern times, the mass of the half-educated, the eagerly gullible prey of the quack, also increased, became indeed a majority. Real power could be based on their wishes, opinions, preferences, and rejections. The charlatan's empire quarterly winded, widened the modern uh, dissemination of knowledge since he operated on his on the basis of science. However, much he perverted it producing growth with a technique borrowed from chemistry and his wonderful balsam, balsams with a apparatus of medicine. He could not appeal to an entire ignorant folk. The illiterate would be protective against his absurdities by their health common issues. His choices audience would be composed of semi-illiterate those who those who had exchanged their common sense for a little distorted information and had encountered science and educated at some time, though briefly and unsuccessfully. The great mass of mankind has always predisposed has predisposed to marvel at mysteries, and this was especially true at certain historic periods when the secure foundation of life seemed shaken and old values, economic or spiritual, long accepted as centuries, could no longer be relied upon. Then the number of charlatans dupes multiplied the self-killers as a 17th century Englishman called them. Man. A lot of stuff right here, bro. Powerful stuff. Yeah, this um, what you just read. It reminds me of L. Ron Hubbard and um, uh, the School of Scientology that was founded way back in I think sixties and seventies. And um, he was he he was um, another cult leader, obviously. And notice how the word knowledge just kept being thrown out. So he was able to persuade all his followers. Um, that he had all this great knowledge that they needed to know, but really, what that cult was founded upon was money, and that, and this is why to this very day you got guys like Tom Cruise as a huge endorser, John Travolta, so on and so forth. And if you talk to anybody that's an ex member, they'll tell you that all this so called knowledge that you acquire and all these things are really for naught because you still end up empty because they take you through these steps and these steps. And it's all about education and wellness, but at the, at the end of it all, it's just politics and money at the end of it all, really. But go ahead. Let's go to the steps of developing a cult. Step one, keep it vague. Keep it simple. To create a cult, you must first attract attention. This should do not... This you should do not through actions, which are too clear and readable, but through words, which are hazy and deceptive. 
Your initial speeches, conversations, and interviews must include two elements. On the one hand, the promise of something great and transformative, and on the other, a total vagueness. This combination will stimulate all kinds of hazy dreams and your listeners who will make their own connection and see what they want to see. To make your vagueness attractive, use words of great resonance, but cloudy, but cloudy meaning, words full of heat and enthusiasm. Fancy titles for simple things are helpful, as are the use of numbers, use of numbers and the creation of new words for vague concepts. All these create the impression of specialized knowledge, giving you a veneer of prof- profoundity. By the same token, try to make the subject of your code new and fresh so that few will understand it. Done right, the combination of vague promise, cloudy but alluring concepts, and fiery enthusiasm will stir people's souls. A, great w- a group will form around you. Talk too vaguely, and you have no credibility, but it is more dangerous to be specific. If you explain in detail the benefits people will gain the following will, will, will gain by following your code will be expected to satisfy them. As a corollary as a corollary to its vagueness, your appeal should also be simple. Most people's problems have complex causes, deeply rooted neurosis, in, interconnected social factors, roots that go away, b- go way back in time, and are exceedingly hard to unravel. Few, however, have the patience to deal with this. Most people want to hear that simple solution will cure their problems. The ability to offer this f- kind solution will give you great power and build you a following. Instead of complicated ex- explanations of real life, return to the primitive solutions of our ancestors. Too good old country's remedy to mysterious panaceas. 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 If I'm, I probably butchered that. Any comments, my brother? Yeah. Um. Really, and that's a perfect description of what I've seen watching plenty of documentaries on how most cults was formed, Heaven's Gate, the Jonestown crew, the Scientology movement, but it always starts with that charismatic man. He's really never clear about what he's talking about. He has a lot of philosophy, and he often contradicts himself, but that's the lore of keeping people interested in what he has to say, because on certain points, He's specific, but not all the time. But the makings of a cult starts with one individual, and people are drawn to this individual, and they're gullible, and they really don't have a nose, per se, in the Bible or any other spiritual book. And this is how people get duped, because people want to believe something, as the article stated earlier. Go ahead. Okay, we're about to wrap it up in just a minute. I'm going to read one more paragraph, and we're going to call it a night. Let me get to it real quick. Yes. Step two, emphasize the visual and the sensual over the intellectual. Once people have begun to gather around you, two dangers will present themselves, boredom and skepticism. Boredom will make people go elsewhere. Skepticism will allow them the dis- will allow them the distance to think rationally about whatever it is you are offering, blowing away the myths you have artfully created and revealing your ideas for what they are. You need a muse. You need you need to muse the board, then ward off the cynics. And cynics are those who criticize, and you know that is commonly going on within Israel, especially when it comes to certain doctrines. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I want to read one more, and I'm finished. Step three, borrow the forms of organized religion to structure the group. Your cult life following is growing. It is time to organize it. Find a way to elevate and comfort and comforting. Organized religion have long held unquestioned authority for large numbers of people and continue to do so in our supposedly secular age. And even if the religion itself has faded some, if forms still resonate with the power, the lofty, and holy associations of organized religion can be endlessly exploited. Create rituals 
for your followers, organizing them into a hierarchy, ranking them in grades of sanctity, and giving them names and titles that resound with religious overtones, asking them for sacrifices that will fill your coffers and increase your power, to emphasize your gathering quasi-religious nature, Talk and act like a prophet. You are not a dictator. After all, you are a priest, a guru, a sage, a shaman, or any other word that hides your real power in the midst of religion. Wow. That resonates a lot. Yes, it does. And it speaks volumes. We see that daily. Yeah. Society. And with that being said, we're getting low on time. We would like to see if any callers would like to press one and chime in and just speak on the matter. What's up with it, though? Anybody? What's the word? All right. <laughs> We're waiting for people to press number one. Uh, we appreciate everybody that calls in for the overtime portion of the show. Again, that number is 319 527 Other than that, we can pretty much get some last words. And uh, nobody's pressing number one. So, that'd be it. All right, my man, LeVar, do your thing. And after me, I mean, do your thing first, and I'm going to do me, and then Sal, we're going to take it out. Yeah, I just uh, thank you guys for the opportunity for me to come on here. And um, I'll hopefully everybody learns something, you know what I mean? It's been a while since I've been on the show. Uh, hopefully I'll get my voice heard again. Uh, just peace to everybody that listened in. I don't have too much more to say. And I just thank you guys for the opportunity. Uh, peace and blessings to all those who follow the most high in Christ. Peace. Man, thank you, Brother LeVar. First and foremost, I would like to thank the almighty and eternal and the unseen force known as El Elyon. Praise him. Much love and thanks to his holy, only, anointed messenger known as Yeshua the Christ. Much love to my man, Sal. Much love to everybody that was listening. We hope this information was very vital. We hope and pray it is, and we hope and pray it was. And like I said, it was a long summer. I've been anxious to get more information out. The Man Up segment is going to stay active. I would like to reach out to the community, whether you be Christian or Hebrew or whatever denomination you choose to go by. Hit my line. Let me know the topics you want to bring out. This is a very interesting bill with my man, LeVar. Much love to uh, to the absolute Bible truth. Much love to the Knesset of Yeshua, Zadok, Judah, Tim, Ephraim, and the rest of the family. And be on the lookout for the second quarter coming up, September 26th. It'll be a show that me and my sis will be hosting. We're going to deliver much more information. And the topic will be exposing Gnosticism. Again, exposing Gnosticism. The name of the show is called The Second Quarter. Me and my sister is Shanti Doc. We finna go in. This season plans to be a strong season. Where the debate talk for you, we are, we're swinging and we got the momentum. And we're taking charge. And with that being said, yo, Sal, I can feel it in the air. <laughs> I'm a fall back, though. All right, I got you, man. Hopefully everybody enjoyed that Man Up segment. And go to the archives, of course, on YouTube. Support the brand. Check us out. For those that don't know, by the way, we have a show tomorrow, family. Yes, we have a show tomorrow. The Hot Seat is back. That's right. (laughs) The Hot Seat, we have a special guest in the Hot Seat. And for those who don't know, that's the show where I invite a special guest, and you call in from beginning to end and ask all your questions to whoever I invite. And that special guest tomorrow is... Devon Mays. So make sure you tune in Whoa. tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Get your, get your questions in and make sure you call in. So we see you guys tomorrow. Take care and y'all bless. Shalom.